Good morning, everybody. Uh, today's speaker is Professor Megan Cassidy Welch from the Australia Catholic University, where she is uh, the program director of Medieval and Early Modern Studies. Professor Cassidy Welch is a cultural and social historian of medieval Europe and the Mediterranean, with uh, particular interests in the history of the Crusades of religious encounter and themes of memory, space, space and violence. Um, Professor Cassidy Welch is giving today a presentation whose title is Medieval, Medieval Humanisms. And thank you very much, Megan, for uh, accepting our invitation. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you um, all of you for the for the invitation to talk to you today. Um, I understand that most of you are researching possibly contemporary issues. There are some philosophers amongst you, some literary studies scholars, I think. So what I'm talking to you about today might be a little bit different to your own area of research, but. I do hope that some historical reflections on this question of humanisms might help you to contextualise some of the other ideas that you might have been encountering in your, in your own disciplines, in your own contexts, in your own fields of, um, of research. So my topic today is medieval humanisms. So what I'm going to do is to present um, a, a very brief and fairly general overview of the historiography or the literature around this idea. Um, and I'll focus on one particularly influential historian of the, of the Middle Ages um, to work through some of those ideas. And then I want to look at a couple of specific case studies or, or settings um, or examples from the Middle Ages where we might find ideas of humanism at work in, in one way um, or another. And then I want to um, end a little more generally really um, by thinking a little bit about what it meant to be human in the medieval period. So I'll unpack all of those things as I as I go on, but um, that's my general structure. So I will just um, give a word of warning, which is that obviously this lecture will be a fairly general overview of all of those things, um, not a, you know, a hugely detailed analysis of all of the um, aspects with which we might engage more fully around these sorts of things. The idea really is to just give you um, especially those of you who are non-medievalists, um, some insight into how we might productively think about humanism outside the usual Renaissance Italy type context, which is where people often start talking about this idea of humanism, um, how we might productively think about it outside of that particular historical context, and also why we might want to do that at all. You know, why is humanism an insightful or useful category um, when we're thinking about um, a period uh, of historical time? So I suppose that's the kind of broad question um, at the at the end of my presentation today. So if we could move to the first slide, that would be good. So let's start with something that's I'm sure fairly familiar to you by this point of your of your study and your exploration of these, um, this idea. So humanisms, what are we talking about when we're talking about historical humanisms? And as you can see from this slide, there are really sort of two, two ways um, that you will have probably already encountered about talking uh, about this category. Um, the first is a very broad kind of definition. We can certainly think about humanism as something like the Oxford English Dictionary does, which is um, a system of thought or action concerned with human in interests or really any aspect of the kind of human race in general. Um, so extremely broad kind of definition um, and one that's probably um, set up to be in opposition to other sorts of forms of knowledge which might perhaps decenter the human by looking, for instance, at the, at the supernatural. So there's a very broad kind of general ahistorical definition, I suppose, um, there at work, um, which is fairly commonly deployed, I think. 
Or, and this is, I suppose, where things become a bit historically specific, you will have no doubt encountered, I think um, Peter Howard talked to you about Renaissance humanisms um, in this series of seminars, maybe this year or last year, about the Renaissance. Um, and you will have discovered from that lecture and from other, other sorts of readings that I'm sure you will have done that humanism can refer to something that's actually really very narrow, um, this academic view um, that humanism is something associated with the study of the humanities, the studia humanitatis, um, particularly associated with the study of Latin texts, those Greek and um, uh, those classical texts, rather Greek and Latin uh, texts that were um, very uh, useful and interesting to Renaissance humanists in particular, um, and tied to that period, as I say, of um, the Italian Renaissance um, especially. So these are the two kinds of strands that you'll probably be familiar with already, you know, this broad definition and perhaps the, the narrower one that's very much pinned to kind of Renaissance thinking. Um, just before I move on to the next slide, I'll just note that I've cited Peter Burke's um, chapter there on the impact of humanism on Western Europe, which is um, something that is fairly old by now, published in 1990, but it still remains actually quite a good overview chapter of um, the terminology and history generally, if you're interested in pursuing that. So if we move to the next slide, um, we can get a little bit more specific um, when we think about medieval humanism as opposed to Renaissance humanisms. Again, I'll be talking fairly generally here. So the idea that the medieval is kind of historically, perhaps philosophically, intellectually um, different <laughs> Uh, from, from the Renaissance is something that kind of actually underpins a lot of um, early scholarship around um, around both the idea of the medieval, the idea of the Renaissance um, and uh, humanism itself. Um, the common view was that humanism was in fact a product of Rena the Renaissance entirely and actually in and of itself something um, of a form of thought and a practice of study that could be differentiated from the medieval era that preceded it. So in a way, these ideas of humanism are very much tied up with ideas of historical periodization, especially that the Renaissance was not something that, med that was medieval, uh, that the Renaissance itself, uh, the Renaissance itself is the start of something new um, uh, and so on. Now, I'm sure that you will have heard of uh, Burkhardt's um, text on the civilization of the Renaissance in Italy. It's, you know, this text which really set the terms um, a very long time ago now of terms of the debate about um, the innovation or the so-called innovation of humanism in the Renaissance. Um, this is obviously a, um, a text that's been heavily critiqued, nuanced and challenged ever since it was published in 1860. But it, also, it has remained sort of deeply influential in, this, in the sense that it, like many other texts that follow, followed it, um, did posit this sort of separation between the medieval and the Renaissance uh, in all different sorts of ways. So one of the things that Burkhardt was interested in talking about in that book was um, the idea that the, the Renaissance was less about the revival of antiquity than about a new sense of individualism that kind of emerged particularly um, initially, particularly in intellectual context, uh, the context of uh, philosophy also from the mid sort of 13th to the mid 16th century. So this idea of Renaissance, this idea of re rebirth um, is not the sudden rediscovery of classical culture in a sense, but is characterised by this sort of centrality of the human person. And this is where um, obviously the notion of humanism is understood to be a very distinctive intellectual phenomenon um, that for Burkhardt anyway, um, begins in Italy in particular. So this idea of um, a new sense of individualism proved very enduring. And even with those various critiques of Burkhardt's periodization and his claims around it, it is still used to some degree to talk about a rather wide kind of vague belief in the dignity of man that's discernible in Renaissance thought. And I cited there um, 
the oration on the dignity of man uh, in the late 15th century, which is often cited as the kind of pinnacle of this sort of thought. And as I intimated before, at the same time, humanism is working for Burkhardt and uh, his followers um, in a very um, specific way too, again, referring to this particularly 15th century um, sort of educational environment of the, um, the Studia Humanitatis. So um, this humanism is not quite like what contemporary humanism might be understood to be today, but is this partly specific form of study um, and in the Renaissance could be productively applied to other areas of life, including, including government. So this Renaissance term um, for the study of grammar, rhetoric, moral philosophy, poetry, history, etc., um, uh, is sort of tied together in the kind of deeper assumption, I suppose, that these forms of knowledge together are what form a human, the study of the humanities, uh, if you like. So I begin with all of that because I think maybe as students of contemporary humanisms, you will have thought about a lot um, what humanism means as a category of analysis, um, particularly possibly, um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, particularly in maybe the context of intellectual history or, or philosophy. Um, but I'm here today as a historian. So I'm doing something a little bit different with this category and thinking about this category in perhaps a slightly different kind of way. And my interest really is sharing, I suppose, with you a little bit about what humanism might have meant and how it might have been used in historical contexts outside of this kind of um, Renaissance setting, which is so very differentiated often from the Middle Ages. So if we move to the next slide, we can begin to, to think about um, the medieval. So the notion that humanism could be used to talk about medieval, not just Renaissance thinking, was tied up with early 20th century attempts to show that there was a Renaissance in the 12th century, in the, in the medieval period itself. This was the claim of someone like Charles Homer Haskins, who wrote an extremely influential book uh, on the Renaissance of the 12th century. Haskins and others thought that the interest in antiquity, the rise of literacy, new modes and new schools of education in cathedrals and then universities during the Middle Ages showed in fact that this was not a dark ages at all. Um, and indeed, at this period of time, particularly the 12th century uh, and into the 13th century, showed some of the same sorts of characteristics as this more well-known Italian Renaissance. Um, Haskins wanted to show that these worlds of learning uh, weren't confined to a later uh, period of time, that they weren't confined just to one geographical area like Italy, but in fact were spread across Western Europe and you can find them in an earlier period of time, again, especially the 12th century. So one of the things that Haskins wanted to do was to demolish this myth of the so-called Dark Ages, this idea originally, I suppose, perpetuated by someone like Petrarch, um, that uh, the idea that uh, intellectual life kind of um, lapsed to some degree during the medieval period, that Renaissance, uh, the, the Renaissance itself, um, the education um, and ideas that were sort of fermenting in, in Italy, particularly from um, the 14th century onwards, were very distinctive um, and, uh, and perhaps were a revival of the sorts of worlds of learning and the worlds of knowledge that um, were characteristic of antiquity. So for someone like Petrarch and um, and for people like Burkhardt, for instance, obviously, you know, the, the medieval period for them roughly from the fall of the Western Empire, um, Roman Empire uh, at the end of the fifth century um, until their own sort of time, um, until Petrarch's time at least, was this period of um, a kind of lack of intellectual product productivity, perhaps even a period of superstition, 
um, a period of time when knowledge was perhaps not prioritised or um, disseminated in the same kinds of ways as we discover in the Renaissance. So Haskins is somebody who's arguing very much against this. Now historians since Haskins' time, and obviously he's writing a good hundred years ago now, uh, historians have nuanced this, developed this, used words other than Renaissance to talk about the Middle Ages for a long period of time. Um, and we would not really use that term uncritically at all, the Renaissance of the 12th century. Um, we would think too that Haskins focused on, on Latinity, um, doesn't really give enough space to things like vernacular language. Um, he certainly didn't give much space or, uh, in his thought to intellectual or, um, exchanges amongst Islamic or Jewish thinkers. Um, we'd probably nowadays more prefer to think about networks of influence and exchange across wider geographies rather than just focus very much on the world of the schools, which is what Haskins did. I'll get to those in a minute. But one of the um, outgrowths of this challenge that Haskins and others raised early on to the idea of the Renaissance, um, this was the claim that we can not just talk about a medieval Renaissance, but we can talk about humanism in the Middle Ages too. So one of the other critiques of, of, of all of this before I start moving on into the specifics um, too is that there were, you know, there wasn't just a, a kind of one medieval renaissance, if you like, in the 12th century, but actually we can find all sorts of worlds of learning and interest in, in culture and knowledge in early periods of time in the court of Charlemagne, the Carolingian renaissance uh, amongst the Ottonians in Germany and the, uh, the uh, 10th century in particular. But I suppose the, the useful kind of um, work around historical periodization that someone like Haskins did all those years ago um, helps us to think about categories of characterizing periods of time uh, and the uh, assumptions that underpin uh, all of that and um, the problems around them. But in terms of humanism, if we could just move to the next slide, um, the scholar who really uh, introduced the idea that we can actually talk about humanism in the Middle Ages uh, was somebody called Richard Southern, and you've got a picture of him there. And again, some time ago, 1970s, so quite a long time ago, he published a collection of essays called Medieval Humanism and Other Studies, an incredibly important collection um, and very interesting too. He was somebody who, um, who saw not just interest in learning and interest in the human uh, in the Middle Ages, but actually, you know, quite a definitive um, or definite rather um, set of characteristics um, around medieval knowledge in some settings that we can kind of call humanism. He also thought that medieval humanism was um, uh, characterised by these three particular areas and I've listed them there. So a sense of the dignity of human nature, um, a sense of the dignity, dignity of nature itself and a sense that the order of the universe is intelligible to human reason. So I'll just go through those in a, a, little, a little bit more detail. So by a sense of the dignity of human nature, Southern argued that although medieval thinkers certainly assumed that human beings, and I'm talking about in Christian culture, um, that although medieval thinkers assumed that humans are fallen creatures, if you like, um, they also thought that, med that people were capable of development in the world, nonetheless. He thought that the natural world itself contained dignity in the sense that it's sort of naturally noble, um, as it were, and in the sense that the natural world is connected to humankind by natural law. So he's seeing these ideas in uh, the work of medieval thinkers. And the idea that nature is sort of orderly and that humans who understand the laws of, of nature um, and themselves are central to the laws, laws of nature show, according to someone like Southern, that medieval uh, thinkers believe that the universe was something that was intelligible to human reason. So those are the sorts of three strands. Now, intrinsic to all of this is the underpinning of Christianity in the Latin West. So these ideas uh, about understanding the universe, about the place of, of humans in the world uh, and uh, understanding about, understandings about um, the natural order of things, natural law, 
Um, these are ideas that are played out in the Christian West, in uh, monasteries, in schools, in universities, uh, all of which were one way or another religious institutions or communities that were concerned with religious instruction um, in various sorts of ways. So the place of the person, what we might describe as the broad idea of humanism in these sorts of contexts, meant that there was a strand of medieval thinking that asserted that that knowledge and understanding could be found not just by revelation alone, but also through human knowledge and endeavour. And it's the interplay of those things that someone like Southern thinks is quite distinctively uh, medieval and, um, and something that we can describe as humanism, this sort of interplay between ways of knowing that are indebted to uh, Christian tradition uh, and new ways of um, understanding the world um, around us. So the idea, the, the overall idea really of this humanism that someone like Southern found in the Middle Ages is, is again quite general. Um, it's about what's important or central to humans um, to help understand the world around them. And for historians like Southern, people of, of um, historians of his generation who were talking about medieval history, it was also a, a really useful way of demonstrating the intellectual depth of medieval thought. Um, Southern was some, someone who also recognised the, um, the conflicts in the Middle Ages sometimes between what we might call humanistic knowledge and styles and uh, theology and, and doctrine itself. And there were certainly many of those sorts of content, content, uh, conflicts rather. But in the half century um, or so since Southern was writing, medievalists have tended to move away from the rather tired debate about whether renaissances were experienced in you know, historical contexts apart from Italy um, and challenged, as I said before, the notion that renaissance is a useful term to think through the ways that cultural change occurs and is expressed. But historians still agree, historians of the Middle Ages still agree that there was an invigorated environment of learning from the 11th century, um, particularly in the 12th and 13th centuries. And I'm suggesting here that humanism was part of that in different sorts of ways. So what we might do now is move on to the next slide and I'll give you a couple of examples. So. All of that uh, part of part of the, the talk today was really to just get you thinking about the idea that the label of humanism, like the label of Renaissance, is used to differentiate historical periods of time. And there's reasons for why people want to do that. Um, uh, and hopefully that's sort of reasonably clear. But something like humanism does remain quite a useful category of analysis, I think, to talk about um, the medieval past. And this is what I will move to now. So I want to start looking at a couple of these contexts. I'll start by looking at monastic contexts in which we might kind of locate humanism or humanistic ways of thinking um, in the medieval past. And then I want to move on to the more sort of familiar world of the schools um, and, and universities. So those are the two kind of case studies, if you like, or examples where we want to, we can see how these ideas might actually play out in practice. So let's start with the monasteries. It might seem a bit strange to think about medieval monastic life in terms of humanism. You would think um, probably rightly that the center of that life was God, not man at all. Um, and that perhaps monastic life and thought would be absolutely antithetical to a humanistic worldview. Uh, and they would be very valid assumptions to make. Um, but I'm suggesting here that um, maybe um, this is not entirely so. So assuming that some of you don't know much about medieval monasticism, I'll just give you a quick overview um, of some of the key features and then we can look at the look at some of the ideas. So monastic life was really one of the kind of dominant forms of, of social and religious organisation throughout the medieval period. Um, and uh, you see the spread of monastic houses and monastic communities throughout uh, Europe, certainly and beyond, uh, from the very early medieval period. 
And you particularly see the growth of what we call cenobitic monasticism or groups living in community, the traditional monasteries that you might um, imagine. These sorts of communities were underpinned by regulations and rules, um, the most influential of which was the rule of St Benedict, um, which laid out the spatial, social, um, liturgical organisation of monastic communities. The idea of um, life, monastic life as it was lived through the Benedictine rule was premised on withdrawal from the world, um, you know, physically and kind of imaginatively, if you like. Um, so withdrawal from the world, simplicity and uniformity, things like divestment of property, uh, observance of bodily regulations, the organisation of the day around the divine office or the cycle of prayer, um, sacred reading and, and manual work. And during the 11th and 12th centuries, this Benedictine form of monastic life was extended um, and reformed and taken up by all different sorts of monastic orders, um, one of which was the Cistercian order. The Cistercians uh, was a religious uh, group with tremendous economic, uh, political and cultural reach um, eventually, but they, like other forms of Benedictine monasticism, they were all committed to the notion that this withdrawal from the world and this life of prayer um, were doing God's work and would draw oneself closer to God in this sort of journey of spiritual uh, union. So if we look at um, Cistercian ideas of spiritual growth, you can certainly see that um, the idea of withdrawal from the world was meant to um, uh, in give monks, individual monks, a chance to be alone with, with God and look inwards. So um, as someone like Richard Southern talked about in relation to medieval humanistic ideas, um, within monastic life itself, there's this kind of introspection, if you like, as an instrument of inquiry. The idea that one can be by <clears throat> oneself in order to know God, but also to understand oneself um, and position oneself in the correct way um, on the spiritual journey. So there is this um, kind of, well, Southern would call it a humanistic introspection as this sort of instrument in, of inquiry um, present in the monastic life as a sort of project or um, community project, if you like, or individual experience as well. So in the 12th century, there are two Cistercian writers, if we could just leap to the next slide, please, Stefano. Thank you. There are two Cistercian writers in particular who give us I think some insight into a couple of the human dimensions of this spiritual growth and knowledge. Uh, and one of these was Bernard of Clairvaux. He was uh, a French Cistercian um, who rose to, uh, to found and become the abbot of Clairvaux Monastery, uh, one of the most important of the Cistercian monasteries. He was someone who was highly politically involved, especially in his relationship with the papacy and various secular leaders and so on. He was asked to preach the Second Crusade. He wrote the rule for the new military order uh, of Knights Templar, which was created uh, in the 12th century. He's well known, of course, for his big conflict with Peter Abelard. He preached against heresy and he was a really prolific writer of, um, of all sorts of things, uh, mostly letters and sermons, particularly a very influential set of sermons on the Song of Songs. Uh, and he wrote a variety of treatises on a huge range of topics, including conversion and all sorts of other things. Now, Bernard of Clairvaux has been called a, a humanist and an anti-humanist. Um, an anti-humanist um, uh, and somebody who's also whose ideas show this sort of analytical and introspective method that was actually quite foundational, uh, according to some to later scholastic culture. So what I suggest, what I'm suggesting here is that Bernard of Clairvaux is somebody who also sees the human as very central in terms of spiritual growth and knowledge. So he's a significant figure to think about 12th century monastic thought, even if he himself um, might have been surprised to have been uh, described as, as a humanist at all. He thought that, uh, that dignity, that knowledge and that virtue were the three, what he called the three nobler gifts of God to man. He thought the dignity was meant free will, human free will, and that that was the distinctive part of being human and what made humans superior to, to beasts. 
He thought that knowledge meant that although people possess free will, that free will is a gift of God and not of their own making. And he thought that virtue was the power by which people seek God. So central to, to all of that was this idea that people are embodied and rational beings. They have this free will, but that's exercised through the physical body and through the rational soul, according to him. So he thought that the human condition itself was this, uh, what he called a unique commingling of matter and spirit with a composite whole sealed in divine image and likeness, he said. So he didn't abhor the human body. He didn't sort of reject it in that, that way that you might um, imagine that monastic um, life would encourage. He considered sort of humans sort of weak and that their bodies needed tending and so forth. But he thought that the human form, you know, the very material condition of humanity, which was embodiment, was an absolutely necessary part of this, what he called commingling of matter and spirit. And so this example quote that I've put up here, where he says, the body is a help to the soul that loves God, even when it's ill, even when it's dead, and all the more when it's raised again from the dead. For illness is an aid to penitence, death is the gate of rest, and the resurrection will bring consummation. So rightly, the soul wouldn't be perfected without the body, since she recognises in every condition it has been needful to her good. The flesh then is a good and faithful comrade for a good soul. So this is absolute necessity that um, that the material quality of humanness uh, is something that uh, is both necessary and runs alongside um, the, the, the spiritual. At the same time, uh, maybe we'll just pop to the next slide. Um, if we can, thank you. Uh, at the same time, he understood that for people to convert to the monastic way of life, it was really important that they know themselves. And this knowing oneself kind of idea was something that he thought um, monks sort of practiced, rehearsed, and um, sort of endeavored uh, to achieve throughout their, their life as these converts to, um, to monastic life. So this, this quote here that I've put up um, is another sort of fairly dense one. It's from a sermon on conversion that he wrote. And this is a sermon that was given in Paris in about 1140. He delivered this sermon not to a bunch of monks, but to those people um, who were clerics, so scholars and students at the schools in Paris. So he was trying to explain to them what he thought conversion meant um, and what it entailed. And it's quite a useful little quote for us. Um, at, at the time that he was speaking, um, the idea of conversion or the word conversio in, in Latin um, was commonly used with a sense of monastic conversion, so entry into a monastic order. Um, but more specifically here, he talks about um, the need for a profound transformation of the inner self as preparation for union with the divine. And he says, here, we see clearly that our true life is only to be found through conversion and there's no other way to enter upon it. This is the beginning of God speaking. And this word, which is addressed to all those who aren't converted in heart, seems to run on ahead. It's a word which not only calls them back, but leads them back and brings them face to face with themselves. For it's not so much a voice of power, but a ray of light is conversion. For what is the purpose of a ray of light or the word, but to bring man to know himself? So again, this knowing of oneself uh, is absolutely integral to Bernard's sort of system of thinking about the nature of monastic life, but also the nature of kind of human striving as he saw it towards union with the divine and knowledge of the divine. Now, this is fairly complex stuff and there's, there are more layers of complexity, obviously, to all of those ideas which you might want to think about later. But just for the purposes of this talk, I wanted to draw your attention to the idea that the human body and the human spirit are essential to Bernard's thought. And this is particularly emphasised in this idea that um, free choice is key to the dignity of man and knowledge of oneself. Can we please move to the next slide? Now, another Cistercian um, 12th century writer 
um, Aylred of Rivo is another good example of the special place of the person in monastic thinking. So Aylred of Rivo was also an abbot, but he was English. Um, he was the abbot of, of the monastery of Rivo in the north of England. He's often been referred to as the English St Bernard. And like Bernard of Clairvaux, was um, a spiritual teacher and a very prolific writer of sermons and saints lives and treatises and all sorts of other things. Now, like St. Bernard, um, Alred wrote about the place of the, the human and the human body in particular in spiritual and monastic life. Um, he again sees the body as intrinsically valuable as proven, he says, by the, by the incarnation. And he sees free will or what we might just um, call human agency, if you like, as endowed by God and characteristic of humanness. So again, like St. Bernard, he's quite interested in this idea of, of will. He thinks that the that free will is the crucial element through which humans can move towards happiness or unhappiness uh, and seek divine knowledge. Alred also wrote really extensively about the idea of spiritual friendship. Um, he wrote this three book um, treatise on spiritual friendship, um, describing a kind of attachment um, that he saw was as essential to creating kind of the relationship between doctrine and experience, um, between the love of friend and the love of Christ, between human life and life with God, as he, as he, as he uh, described it. The idea here, according to Alred, is that God created humans to be in relationship with each other, as well as in a relationship with the divine. So being in community is especially important for spiritual growth. So not surprising for someone who's following the monastic life community is very important. And this is how he explains it. He says that the friendship that community life entails is a spirit, a sort of form of spiritual love um, that mirrors love for the divine. And this little quote that I've uh, put up here from his text on spiritual friendship gives you some idea about that. Um, so he says, thus rising from that holy love with which a friend embraces a friend to that which a friend embraces Christ, we shall rejoice in the supreme and eternal good and friendship to which on earth we admit but few will pour out over for all and flow back to God for all, for God will be in all. Um, this sort of idea was really essential um, for the rationale of monastic life, of course, where people live in communities working together in prayer and manual labour. Um, but we might also think about those ideas perhaps as, as humanistic in inflection. Monastic community um, depended on mutual love of one's brethren and was what, um, as one historian described, um, a channel of grace that leads humans in this life to the knowledge and love of God in the spirit and flesh of Christ. If we go to the next slide, um, we can see Alred's thinking about this in a little bit more detail. Um, he wrote that the day before yesterday, writing about himself, um, as I was walking around the cloister of the monastery, the brethren were sitting uh, around, forming as it were a most loving crown in the midst um, with the, of, the, of the delights of paradise, um, with the leaves, fruits, uh, flowers and fruits of each single tree, I marvelled. In that multitude of brethren, in this monastic setting, I found no one whom I did not love and no one by whom I felt sure I was not loved. I was filled with such joy, it surpassed all of the delights of this world. So this kind of experienced connection between people who are all committed to the same kind of search of not for knowledge, spiritual knowledge and knowledge of themselves, this sort of focus on yearning for the divine um, is, I think, quite humanistic in the broadest sense. So what we also have in monastic thought is the, the idea that the self is needed for awareness and movement towards God. So monastic life in the 12th century isn't about giving all that up necessarily. The self has to be sort of dissolved in some ways in, uh, um, in the idea, uh, in the thought of, of Alred and Bird, um, in that one has to sort of turn towards God to enter the monastic life and reconstituted um, in community. But there's a sort of sense of self that you might describe as being a kind of psychosomatic whole that was always in dynamic relationship with community and was always about knowing uh, and about striving for knowledge. Um, 
so you can think about whether you would also describe that as humanistic uh, in character or not. Okay, if we go to the next slide, please, um, we will turn to something, um, a, a slightly different context. Now, outside of this, of monastic life, during the 12th century in particular, um, you see the growth of schools and eventually universities. Monastic schools were always uh, important, of course, and um, there were certainly centres of learning attached to cathedral schools well before the 12th century. As bishops were always required to educate their, um, their clergy and maintain a school in their, their diocese. But it's in the 12th century that you see um, the growth of um, really important cathedral schools uh, at places like Chartres, um, particularly, yeah, particularly in France, but, but in other places too. Places like Chartres, places like Notre Dame were very significant, um, as were the schools that were attached to particular masters or teachers. Some of those masters um, acquired celebrity status during this time. Someone like Peter Abelard, for instance, um, was uh, a very uh, famous uh, teacher. These schools were, were, were mostly, as I say, in Northern Europe, but places like Toledo were also really important for copying, translating and studying Greek and Arabic uh, philosophical and mathematical works. Now, these 12th century schools were essentially liberal arts schools. They taught grammar, um, logic and rhetoric, that's the, the so-called trivium, and, the, and music, arithmetic, ge uh, geometry uh, and astronomy, the so-called quadrivium course of study. These were all very significant elements of the curriculum as these schools were designed to educate future priests um, and clerics who needed to be able to read and understand the scriptures and to explain and communicate the right kind of interpretations of it. But, but for our purposes, the schools and their scholarly heirs are most often thought of as humanistic or providing the foundations for humanism um, in a few key ways. And I'll just outline a couple of these, if we could jump to the next slide, please. So the two key ways, really, that the 12th century schools are um, providing the foundations for later humanisms or creating kind of a sort of humanism of their own uh, in, um, their, in the centrality of classical texts in the way that they teach and also um, in their kind of apprehension of the idea of the individual. So I'll start with the, the centrality of classical texts here. Um, and I'll start with a quote from um, one philosopher, John of Salisbury, um, who wrote that we are like dwarves sitting on the shoulders of giants. We can see more and further than the giants could, not because we have got superior sight or stand taller than they did, but because we are lifted on high and raised up by their immense height. This is a lovely quote, which really draws attention to the debt that these um, medieval thinkers felt that they owed to um, classical authors. Um, there's a general revival of interests in various sorts of antique Greek and Latin texts uh, in these schools and uh, amongst the masters during this time uh, in a range of areas including literature and law, philosophy, science, medicine um, and education. Um, the Digest of Justinian, for instance, at this time becomes the absolute foundation for the discipline of Roman law as it's being taught uh, in these schools. Um, in the schools and later in the universities, we see previously unavailable um, trans, uh, treatises of Aristotle being translated, commented on and, and taught. We know certainly that monasteries possessed classical texts in their libraries and read them. So it's not just that things had disappeared and were only discovered in these cathedral schools. Um, but rather, um, in these non-monastic settings, these school settings, these, um, these classical texts are uh, seen as instructive and relevant in new ways at this particular time. The sorts of methods that are being used in these environments um, is quite distinctive as well. Um, someone called um, Peter Abelard um, uh, talked about the idea of taking up the arms of dialectic, the arms of, of argument. And that's quite a useful way of thinking about how um, these ideas and methods were thrashed out in the schools. Um, they're sort of, you know, highly combative form of, of, of learning. Um, disputation is the kind of, um, kind of key way of um, arguing. 
um, and um, in these sort of you know very masculine cultures of of education and learning there's a this sort of um, as I say a very combative kind of element to them um, Aristotle, as I said, is particularly influential during this time and during the 13th century when um, uh, these translations become uh, much more available. Two key texts um, were the categories and, and on interpretation, for instance, so these sorts of ethical uh, considerations. There are a lot of commentaries produced um, on Aristotle at this time uh, and other key texts as well. These could be fairly simple commentaries um, in in Latin on on logic, um, or they could be sort of fairly sophisticated commentaries, um, uh, like the one Abelard himself wrote on Arist Aristotelian logic um, and various other sorts of of commentaries as well. There's also a very distinctive form of commentary that starts to be produced at this time in the form of of questions, where a book would be commented on by posing questions related to its content. And all of those sorts of texts were highly influential in the production of other sorts of medieval commentary, um, including the very fundamental sentences of Peter Lombard, which I've just cited there, where he set out in the early 13th century all the problematic questions in theology and proposed solutions, so a big text. Other, other classical influences um, that were particularly key in the schools were you know, Boethius' text on um, division and reasoning and uh, syllogisms and so on, and Priskian on, on grammar and other things. So that's one thing, the centrality of classical texts, um, not as kind of things to be um, necessarily just venerated and accepted, but as sort of vehicles for um, understanding and um, engaging in disciplinary kind of argument and uh, again the construct construction of knowledge. Um, if we could just jump to the next slide. Um, the second way in which we um, see something quite distinctively perhaps humanistic in the schools um, is the idea of the discovery of the individual which is sort of a grand claim. Um, it's a historiographical notion this idea of the discovery of the individual. Uh, a notion that during this time, particularly the 12th century, there's a big spike in kind of personal, reflective, autobiographical writings, and this somehow indicates that there's a new interest in the self, not just in the monastic settings where I've been talking about, but um, uh, in, uh, in educational contexts where the interior person, um, what we'd now call the self, I suppose, um, is, uh, is being thought about um, in different ways. Um, the idea is that there's a new emphasis here on the inner motivation of people, on sort of psychological development, on the emotions and, and what that all means. So it's, it's not the same sort of post-Freudian self that we might uh, kind of imagine today. The idea in these medieval writers was the idea of discovery in oneself of human nature made in the image of God. But nonetheless, there's, there's real interest um, in the inner landscape of the person um, in different ways during this time. And, and Peter Abelard um, provides an, another good example of this uh, in his text um, on the story of my misfortunes, the Historia Calamitatum, um, which is his very famous kind of autobiographical account of his own life, particularly focusing on his rise to prominence as a, um, a very famous teacher um, his academic career, um, the conflicts that he came, um, uh, that emerged as a result of his own sort of celebrity status as a teacher of renown, uh, and his relationship with Eloise, uh, his famous relationship with, <coughs> pardon me, with Eloise, um, uh, his subsequent persecution um, and his new life uh, as a monk uh, when he was sort of forced out of, of Paris. Um, the Historia Calamitatum is um, it's an excellent read if anyone uh, wants to read something medieval. Um, it sort of takes the form of this autobiographical letter to an unnamed friend and it's often really just thought about as the, as the text which talks about his relationship with Eloise but it's quite a lot about his own self-conception and his own feelings about how he relates sort of intellectually and spiritually to ideas of tradition. He says that you know he proceeds in his life not just through tradition, but you know through what he describes as his own talent um, and his sort of intellectual prowess. 
And that uh, the story that he tells there of his own um, sort of journey from celebrated master to, to monk um, certainly shows that he's got this historical awareness of his his place as a sort of monk scholar, and kind of on the fringes of um, of tradition, um, that's on the fringes perhaps of education. But it's a, a great example of this idea that the self is being kind of presented um, in distinctive and important ways during this time. So there's an idea, I think, in, in monastic and, and scholastic life that um, outward behaviour kind of reflects uh, inner virtue and this sort of focus on interiority is a way of, of doing that. Um, I'm aware of the time, so I'm not going to go on for too long. We might just leap to the next slide. Um, I've been sketching out some contexts in which ideas of humanism might be present in those medieval monastic strands of thought and in this, this school, um, the, the context of the schools. But I wanted to end by, um, by thinking about whether you could imagine humanism applying outside of the intellectual realm um, or in the me medieval period. So if you think about humanism as being what it is to be human, then I think you can also usefully look at wider cultural attitudes to the body, to other people, um, to the organisation of social relationships, um, and certainly to uh, other, ethnicity, other ethnicities or other religions um, and so on, um, to think about how you might see humanism as perhaps also having some slightly problematic manifestations, particularly during the medieval period. And I'll just end the, this lecture by giving you three examples of what I've described as kind of Christian anthropologies. Um, this, this period of time that I've been talking about, um, mostly across the 12th century, is also a period of time when the crusading movement emerges. So that this is a, this is a religious movement that practices and um, preaches holy war, particularly against Muslims in the Holy Land, but um, against other enemies as well, eventually. Um, and there's a whole complex history behind all of that. But one of the justifications for this holy war was the idea that Muslims themselves were another race and in fact they were outside of humanity. So what exactly was a Muslim was sometimes a little bit unclear um, prior to the 12th century um, and you find all sorts of um, pejorative terms such as Saracen being used to describe what are actually very disparate groups of, of people. Um, but what you do find is that the anthropological position of Muslims, whoever they were decided to be um, during this period of time, uh, is called into, into question in a range of ways. So you, you find texts where uh, Muslims are described as creatures of another race, as, as insects, as, as animals, um, a whole lot of abusive kind of language here. And I've put this quote um, on the slide to give you um, a sense of the kind of discourse that was out there in relation to this particular group. This is a, a representation of the preaching of the First Crusade, um, which was preached at the right at the end of the 11th century and precipitated um, the rest of the crusading movement. And you can see right from the outset this idea that um, that uh, the Franks or the, the French who, to whom this sermon was preached are uh, a distinctive kind of race themselves, a race beloved and chosen by God, and that uh, the, uh, the Muslims against whom they are being um, urged to go into to battle against are um, uh, a race from the kingdom of the Persians, an accursed race, a race wholly, wholly alienated from God. So in the same kind of way, I suppose, that we see um, interest in the body, the embodied self, what it means and one's journey to sort of spiritual knowledge in monastic settings and even in scholastic settings, at the very same time you've also got sort of the idea that, um, that humans are, are not the same um, and that um, this sort of combination of perhaps embodiment and religion um, can also lead to um, exclusion in various sorts of ways. If we could jump to the next slide, Stefano, there's only a couple more to go. Um, you see the same 
sort of um, of rhetoric um, in medieval preaching against Jewish communities. Again, the same time uh, as uh, all of these other sorts of discourses are being kind of um, uh, emerging, you see cultural attitudes towards Jewish communities replicating this sort of um, ambiguous and but generally negative framing um, that you've just seen uh, in relation to Muslims. Amongst all of, of this, and, and of course, there's a longer history to, to anti-Judaism um, anti and anti-Semitism, but amongst the ideas at this particular time was the idea that Jewish bodies themselves are somehow distinctive. Uh, it was thought that Jewish bodies were, were weakened by the ritual of circumcision. Um, it was that was thought to be um, emasculating. Uh, it was thought to be evidence that Jews adhered to stubbornly to a ritual that was superfluous after the baptism of Christ. So there's this kind of mobilisation of critique against um, particular bodies uh, in order to um, to shore up, I guess, doctrinal certainties around Latin Christianity. Jewish bodies at this time are associated with leprosy. Um, they're thought to have a unique physiognomy. They're said to be um, highly sexualized, prone to melancholy and illness. This is all sort of a kind of pantheon of, of accusations about the nature of, um, of the Jewish body at this time. So they're not uniformly delineated, these ideas during the crusading period, but they're part of this package of cultural attitudes um, that develop across Western Europe um, uh, and are certainly highly visible. And I've just put some images there, one including the image of a synagogue and ecclesia on Bamboo Cathedral, uh, where the, um, the blind uh, synagogue uh, is represented in um, opposition to um, the, the, the light of the Gospels or, or the new law. Uh, and this is often um, a motif in sermons as well about uh, anti-Jewish thinking. And for the final um, little commentary on uh, Christian anthropologies, we might just go to the next slide. Um, Could we jump to the next slide, please? Is it? Yeah, there should be another another slide there. Nope, not happening. Doesn't matter. It's the last one. Um, the the last example is the example of attitudes towards um, heretics. Um, during this time. So again, you know, you see a sort of um, Christian anthropology or a sort of, you know, the Christian human being constructed around the exclusion of the other and um, and anti-heretical legislation and anti-heretical ideas uh, are part of this in the same way that anti-Muslim and anti-Jewish ideas are as well. So um, there's a gradual criminalization of heresy throughout the 12th century and into the 13th century. Um, there's an increasing use of violence against heretics as well. Um, and the, um, the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215, um, a, huge, um, a huge council uh, of, of the church, articulated very clearly that um, there is one, as it said, there's only one community of the faithful outside of which there is no salvation. Uh, and goes on to sort of talk about heretics as being uh, little foxes, serpents, dogs, the shadows of the world, a plague, you know, all of these kind of dehumanising kind of um, ideas too. Um, so I make, I make those, those points um, to really just, um, I guess, emphasise that being human um, meant identifying who was not human uh, or what elements of others were in contradiction to Christian humanness. And that's something that's really quite distinctive in medieval thinking. It all goes to forge a sort of set of, of right or correct Christian identity, something called Christendom, in fact, and uh, as I've described it, a Christian anthropology. So I'm not sure if we're going to get to the very final slide, which is just a summary slide. It um, probably doesn't matter if we don't. Um, but what I wanted to do really is to um, present a set of examples to introduce you to a number of contexts where medieval thinkers and writers might have been said or might be said to have been practicing or defining different kinds of humanism. And you can see that there's a 
very wide range of intellectual, social and cultural settings where we might find these humanistic ideas or practices. And that in itself, I think, will, um, will tell you that there isn't a single definition of medieval humanism that we can pin down and in fact it's not very useful to try and, and do that. You'll also see that humanism carries with it some historical burdens too. And I've just noted a couple of examples just at the end of the lecture there where ideas of humanity and the person are used to define those outside of the community of the faithful. So there's this, as I said, anthropological dimension to humanism that can have darker overtones than celebratory notions of the dignity of man uh, and so on. So although Petrarch, who lived in himself in the 14th century, thought that the thousand years between the collapse of the Western Roman Empire and his own time was a, um, a middle time of darkness and ignorance and forgetfulness, I hope that you can see that this isn't the case. And what we might think of as humanism, both generally and in the context of intellectual thought, owed much, in fact, to that middle time, uh, to that medieval period. And I think I will stop there. Thank you.